This demonstration is designed to instruct you on using Metastock software and accompanying plugins. It is not a recommendation to buy or sell exchange traded instruments, but rather guidelines to interpreting and using specific indicators and features within the software. The information, software, and techniques presented should only be used by investors who are aware of the risk inherent in trading. Thomson Reuters shall have no liability for any investment decisions based on the use of their software, any trading strategies, or any information provided in connection with the company. Well, thank you, Kelly, for the introduction, and uh, welcome everyone for uh, attending and listening in on the webinar. One note before I get into the, the meat of the presentation, I do see, uh, and Kelly, this is for you, I see on my sidebar, some apparent, I don't know, apparently there may be an echo out there so that everyone hears clearly. I don't know if you see that message. Apparently certain listeners are getting an echo if there's anything we can do so as to ensure clarity of uh, reception. If there, if, if, if that's, if we, oh, no echo, okay. Apparently the problem was resolved in general. So I feel comfortable in proceeding. And again, Kelly, thanks to you for your assistance in uh, getting me set up here. And uh, thanks for the listeners to, uh, I hope you get something out of uh, what I want to talk about. And again, to reiterate what Kelly just indicated, the topic for today is trend analysis. Uh, one thing I want to say is a pre- kind of uh, preempt to that. Um, I'm, I've been, as Kelly indicated, I've been in this business a long time, almost 30 years. I've been actually teaching with the folks at Pacific Trading Academy now for about eight years. And as a good segue into my topic, a question that perennially arises from the student traders that I work with, uh, and it's forced me to, in an explicit sense, address a question that I kind of has been harboring and, and, and for most of us as traders, harbors in the back of our minds all along. Sometimes we address it in an explicit sense, sometimes we just leave it hanging. Uh, and that is, what is a trend? We all have this sense, uh, or most of us at least who have been in this business for a while, uh, talk in terms of trend, we utilize the concept uh, in, a, in an off the matter uh, way. We always, it, it's a concept that is pervasive throughout this business. I would venture to submit to the listeners that trend analysis, or it's uh, however we define it, is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, forms of market analysis since the beginning of, of individuals trying to profit from securities and different market motion. But I, it's kind of like the analogy to the old running joke of putting 10 economists in a room and trying to get a unified output of, of viewpoint. If you, you know, how does one define the trend? We've all heard the little market maxim that has kind of transitioned over time into a cliche, trade with the trend, or the trend is your friend. Well, that's fine insofar as it goes, but we need to, I think, have some objective means by which we can all agree how, that we're going to define the trend. Uh, it becomes more of a vacuous concept to the extent we cannot objectively define trend. Um, and so we want to give it some uh, juice. We want to give it some power because I do believe that trend is the most important aspect of all. I'm often asked by uh, co you know, trading partners, friends in the business, um, on, on all levels as well as student traders, what is my checklist? Where, where do I assign or what, to what, uh, what given amounts of priority do I assign to different forms of analysis or different methodologies or different um, approaches and systems that are out there? And we all know, and if you don't, if you're a beginning trader or at the formative stages of your career in this business, let me state for the record, we don't, as a, as a body of, of uh, participants in this business, to my knowledge at least, there is not one equation or paradigm or so-called holy grail uh, understand, that would give us a, a complete composite understanding of market behavior and dynamics. Uh, there's an infinite... Uh, markets are infinite, I guess is what I really want to say to get to the point. And we're stacking up a finite body of knowledge against this infinite system, in a sense, if you can think about it. Uh, and as I had a conversation just yesterday evening with uh, a, a, a trader who indicated that they wanted to uh, have a sense of, uh, of, of how, did she, how can she gauge her progress in this, in this program. Um, and I said, well, you want to make sure, no matter what you know, you always want to leave yourself open to uh, uh, learning more uh, information. So I'm using this kind of as a preamble to um, indicate we always want to learn more. 
in terms of uh, trend and market analysis in general. Okay, what I thought I would do is, and, and I've spent a lot of time, years in fact, uh, coming up with objective means by which one can define and differentiate trend. I always tell people there are only three things a market can do if we're observing it in the normal way or the way that in which we typically do so. And that is for most of us looking at it on a, on a uh, computer monitor or a screen. When I started, again, almost 30 years ago, uh, things were on paper for the most part. We had a paper, but it's still a, a flat surface. So on a flat surface, if you're viewing market activity, essentially what we're doing is monitoring uh, a, a system on a two-dimensional way. And there are only three general directions of allowable motion when we're viewing market or price action. I say very succinctly, a market can go up, it can go down, or it can go sideways. Now, in a general directional sense, you and I, all the traders out there, or would-be traders, and myself included in this process, can only profit if a market's rising or falling. So for the moment, I only typically like to consider markets that are doing just that, rising or falling. For those markets for which the net motion is sideways, I pretty much eliminate those markets from further consideration or analysis as potential candidates for value or generating or extracting a profit. So I, it's kind of a, a, by default, I tell everyone I work with, I'm not interested in, in markets that are channeling sideways. Even that terminology is somewhat vague. And so the whole point of tonight's conference is to uh, present some objective techniques that I have thought about and that I've used actively all along and still do in my trading, by which, number one, we can define trend in more objective terms rather than having it be a subjective idea out there, rather nebulous, on the one hand. And on the other hand, differentiate trend. How do you know? How does one determine what the trend is so that you then, in a secondary sense, have the capacity to make the decision, do I choose to trade with the trend or against it? It's one thing to trade with a trend and know your, or trade against a trend, let's say, a predominant or a primary trend, however one defines such, uh, and know you're trading against the trend. And it's an altogether different proposition to be trading against a given trend, let's say, and have no clue that you are out of sync with a primary trend, uh, all for the purpose of uh, maximizing or optimizing our, ch our odds for success. So with that being said, that's a long introduction. Let me move forward. Here's an outline as we see on the slide in front of you. These are the four separate forms of trend analysis by which I can more closely approximate in some objective fashion uh, how one defines trend and how we can think of trend. Trend lines, number A, or item A, is probably the oldest, if not the second oldest. Maybe, you know, something maybe like candlestick analysis is, is probably on par in terms of the amount of time that traders have been utilizing these. Trend lines have their pros and cons. By the way, all of these forms of analysis that you see here on the screen, trend line analysis, trend velocity, and I'll get into that in a second, weekly chart analysis, indicator uh, trend confirmation. These are four discrete and very, very different approaches that I typically utilize on an ongoing basis uh, in a homogeneous sense. In other words, I mix them all together um, to kind of see and look for the convergences or when they get into alignment. But these are four very different approaches that I'm going to elaborate on in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, let me say this. I'm going to repeat something. Um, I was a little distracted a minute ago. I had whistles and bells going off around these. But there's a point I want to make, and that is um, a, a conversation that just came up, and it constantly comes up. Uh, and I didn't answer. I posed the question, but I want to uh, provide the answer to the listeners tonight. Everyone wants to say, well, what's your trading plan, or how do you formalize a system? Um, and essentially, my trading plan is to create a, a set of criteria uh, and use that, and, and an essential ingredient of this criteria set, if you will, is that each one of the items in the soup, so to speak, are inherently different from the other. It does you or me no good unless by a quirk of circumstantial chance to have a series of tools, methodologies, systems, etc., that comprise your overall approach to finding value in markets. If they're all, if essentially each of the elements is more or less the same thing or very similar, you're essentially looking at your analysis and is probably very harmful to your trading overall. So by definition, whatever you do and whatever 
approaches you use, you want to make sure that each approach, each separate uh, approach or system or idea that you incorporate into your overall trading business or plan should be different one from another. And so this is an essential feature. But my checklist is, is, is as follows in terms of uh, how I select good opportunities and how I, bottom line, select my trades. I always tell people trend analysis is at the top of the totem pole or the number one item in terms of the hierarchy of overall importance I place on uh, my looking for good trades. Number two, a close second, but it's still number two on the, on the totem pole, is my timing studies. This gets us into the area of GAN analysis, and those initiated may have some degree of familiarity with that. That's not the topic for our conversation tonight, but I'm just giving you the sense of the checklist. Number three on that checklist on the totem pole, for me personally, would be a broad-based, very comprehensive market model, such as something like uh, nonlinear theory or Elliott wave, something like that. It's a broad-based market model that um, can scale or use uh, in a number of different applications on different time frames. You can scale it and utilize it in, in many ways. And lastly, something simple like um, a generic study and relationships such as divergence. Those four things uh, indicate for what my checklist of items are, and I use each one as a filter, one against another, to locate value. But the reason I've mentioned that in an explicit sense to, to the listeners tonight is to point out and to, again, reemphasize, notice where trend is. It's at the top of the totem pole. And that's the reason for this webinar this evening. Uh, there, everything else other than trend, every form of analysis from A to Z, soup to nuts, and everything on the list that I've just indicated to you represents my top four items, the items to which I assign the greatest amount of credence and weight. They're all, everything is, the trend is separate from the other three in that the sense trend is the only thing that is always correct 100% of the time. Everything else, as valuable and as helpful as it can be, uh, is arbitrary from the standpoint that it is giving you and me as, and as market observers a sense as to what we can expect. We're trying, we, we, we find our thinking or our brain shifting into what I call anticipatory mode. Trend analysis, in the, in the way that I'm going to uh, discuss in part tonight, is the only thing that's non-arbitrary because it always is correct. It is never, by definition, incorrect. Now, there's a degree of agnosticism embedded in this in that though we know it's correct, we don't know why it's correct. And this is the reason why traders typically incorporate, along with their trend analysis, alternate forms of analysis. But every form of analysis other than trend analysis is, by definition, arbitrary because it creates the paradigm of what should a market do versus the competing paradigm of trend analysis, which is always pointing your focus of thought to is. So we have this polarity of concept set up between the notion of what is occurring versus what should or could be occurred occurring based on historical precedent or a set of statistics backing up a particular approach or methodology or system or a theoretical concept. Let me say this to, to again, finally reemphasize the importance of trend analysis. You and I, all, to all of you listeners out there, whether you know it or not, consciously or unconsciously, we only get paid in this business to the extent your positions are in strict, direct alignment with the trend, period. You could have a million things telling you the market should be doing this or should be doing that. And if you get positioned solely on that basis, and the trend, the reality of the market, is doing something other than what you're, or how you're positioned. In other words, if your positions are out of alignment with the reality of what the trend is telling you is the case, moment by moment, what I call the now moment. You've, I always fondly tell people, you have a problem right then and there, or I guarantee you, you will shortly. It's that simple. You and I only get paid <clears throat> in this business, and ostensibly that's the reason why we're all here, to make money or to optimize our financial returns how, however subsequently we've located high probability basins, if you will, of value. That's really why we do this or why I do it. So what I've found here, since this is, I've, I think I've sufficiently impressed upon the listener, you guys now, the importance that I place on trend and trend analysis. It is number one because it's always correct. The other factors that make up my checklist or yours or any other traders for that matter I simply look at to find those interesting points in time 
when they happen to corroborate and agree or move into alignment with what the trend analysis and the way I'm going to describe to you in various ways this evening has already told me is the reality of the market. To the extent I see the, the alignment, the greater the alignment, the greater the probability of the potential bet that I'm going to place concerning a given market. Okay. What I found and what I'd like to do again in uh, to be consistent with this notion of convergence. When I say convergence, all I'm meaning here is we want to have in any form of market analysis or technical analysis, quantitative, fundamental, whatever, you want to get alignment. You want to get things that are very, very different by design. And as such, due to their intrinsic design differences, are going to have tendencies of, or different sensitivities to how markets motion and the motion of the market. When in, dis in spite of those differences, you see the various different types of analyses lining up and leading you to a similar output of co or conclusion. That's where you know you have a higher probability bet. And even within an intra-analysis, even within trend analysis itself, there are various ways, various and sundry ways by which we can determine the trend. And that's the reason for this little outline on the slide you see here. Trend lines, trend velocity, weekly chart analysis, Indicator trend confirmation is the last item I'm going to touch on this evening. It's based on a, on a, on a relationship that I kind of came up with about nine years ago to define trend. All of them have their strengths and weaknesses, but together there is where we can extract the synergy and increase our odds for being on the right track. Let me start with trend lines. And a trend line is very simple. It's the, the purpose of a trend line, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the oldest forms of analysis. You see a, a chart here with a couple of different or two different trend lines. If I if we look at number one to two, what we've done is simply connect a straight line connecting the bottoms of the motion of the market. This is again one of the oldest forms of analysis. Uh, it's competing with probably candle analysis going back 200 years as, or, or so ago. Uh, and the purpose of trend line, well, one of the primary purposes of basic trend line analysis that we see here is to try and contain the market's motion that, uh, through the present point. And based on the assumption of linearity, we can extrapolate or extend, as you see, the same line that connected two bottoms at point one and point two out into the future. And the idea is that you, we can not only contain and approximate the future price motion, but we can actually use it to predict and forecast potential areas of support and resistance. And to the extent markets move in a linear fashion, there's linearity inherent in the market motion, a trend line is a basic concept, quite simple. Nothing complicated here. As I said, it's one of the oldest forms of analysis. By the way, as a side note concerning trend line analysis, one of the reasons that basic trend line analysis and the way I'm describing right now is still, is still as effective as it is, however effective that might be, over all these years that it's been employed. And everyone basically is, is familiar with this. And in a general sense, to the extent more and more people or more and more trading entities are aware of something, that tends to, in an inverse sense, kind of reduce the eff efficacy of that form of analysis. The reason why trend line analysis in a very basic sense is as effective however even in light of this saturation if you will is because it's a vague form of analysis it's very subjective it takes me back to what I said a few minutes ago about putting 10 economists in a room and getting and, and not and very doubtful you're gonna get a single consensus same thing with trend lines you can have 10 different traders look at the same chart like we're looking at, at right now the very same set of trend lines and get very very diff differing opinions but it's due to that subjectivity of, you know, of, of, of output and conclusions that is, that's the reason why trend lines are still as effective as they are. Were they more objective or specific, by now their efficacy would have been significantly reduced even more so than it has over the years. That being said, um, we, if you look at trend line, this, another trend line, the other line on the chart from point two to three, it effectively contains, uh, all we did here is connect some bottoms. You connect two points, two bottoms in this case, point two, and we it ran it off another uh, bottom there, kind of in the center of the of the slide. I don't know if you can see my pointer. I, I don't know. I, maybe you can't. But in any case, um, you were simply running it off the bottoms. 
because we see that the trajectory of the trend has changed and so we're constantly adjusting the fit of the trend line to accommodate the new behavior or realm that the market has uh, moved into. Um, I'm going to come back to this slide in a, in a little later on to uh, more to present a more sophisticated technique or application of the basic trend line analysis. But you can see even the initial trend line that was run off of point one and two depicted in the slide caught pretty well, it didn't perfectly catch some of the bottoms further out to the right at point three. And then when we create when we created the variation on the trend line uh, that uh, when the market uh, moved up, it had a slightly steeper slope. You can see that it caught one of the tops right at point uh, three. Uh, so that's the very basic. Everybody in, in every beginning course on, on technical analysis or market analysis, one of the first intros is just general trend line analysis. Um, I want to move on now and move to a variation on the theme. And I want to bring up the topic of geometric angles. This is a concept that was basically championed primarily. The, well, there are a number of traders back in the early to mid 1900s, uh, i.e., 1WD Gann, George Baer, a number of uh, pioneers, if you will, uh, who I consider to be, it, uh, by proxy at least, my teachers, um, utilized the concept of geometric angles. It's an extension or a, an application of basic trend line analysis that incorporates certain geometric shapes, squares, circles, ellipses, for example, are some uh, common geometric shapes that have been used in conjunction with simple trend line analysis uh, to more effectively and efficiently define trend. Um, this technique is a type, what you see here in this slide is an application of trend line analysis to a square or actually a geometric angle idea. What we've done is if you look at the bottom of the chart where the lines are emanating from off of that bottom on the left hand side of your screen and you see the top here uh, um, where I have the, you notice the, we, we've essentially broken the initial thrust of, uh, or move up into thirds and this is a type of trend line analysis. The generic name is known as speed resistance lines. Uh, incidentally the Metastock program does this automatically for us. So you don't have to calculate this and do it by hand manually. Uh, I'm familiar with this. I used to do this manually by hand. You know, I'm talking more than 20 years ago before we even had uh, computers that automates it. But the Metastock program is quite elegant in its application. It's a click of a button or two, and you can get this up. And that's essentially what we did here. So what we've done is we've observed through visual just ob observation of the market. We saw an initial thrust from the bottom, from which the three lines are emitting, the trend lines. And then we hit the top there of the initial impulse move, and I simply dropped a plumb line or a perpendicular straight down. I'm essentially measuring the height of the move up from the bottom to the top. I then, and with this technique, with the speed resistance lines, we simply trisect or divide that initial, the length uh, or the vertical height of the move into thirds. So we see the intersection points. You divide that initial height of the move into thirds and then you run a trend line through that point uh, or through those uh, points. And those lines, when extended out to the right, will very often capture a large portion of the price action and actually forecast tops and bottoms or levels of support and resistance that will ultimately be significant, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so that's an application of trend line analysis incorporated or along with when we take into account some geometry that uh, I guess W.D. Gann was the primary proponent or originator of this idea, if not others. Uh, I have an extension or a generalization of this idea. This is a Gann fan that we have set up. And now, again, another indicator easily brought up on your Metastock platform where we have some additional angles. Uh, very often you can break the, the height of a move up into quarters, into halves, into eighths. Uh, as well as into thirds. The thirds, when you break up the height of a move into thirds, it's just known as the speed resistance line technique. Here you have the generalization of that idea, if you can see the screens, um, uh, or you see the fan. Each of these lines that came from, oh, all I did here is select a, an appropriate bottom back in July, and I measured the move up to the initial top here. Um, uh, I'm trying to find the date. It's probably around in, let's see, in August, first part of August. I, one thing I see, I don't have the date marked off there, but you can see it's where the uh, third line in from the left 
almost touches. That's the top. And then I dropped, in theory, what you would do is drop a perpendicular straight down, measure the height, and then you break up that length into quarters and into thirds, and you're going to run your trend lines through those points. And very often, again, you will see that those lines run out or extended out into time will capture uh, market motion. Or put a different way, you often see the price action hewing very closely. As you see more recently, look at the last month, how the market has run off of that, uh, that, um, that trend line and used it as a level of support. It's just kind of hewing very closely as a, as a level of support above which. And it's very elegantly defining the trend there. It doesn't always work as well as this, but very often it does. And again, we're using all of these things. Our context of interpretation is that we're using each one of these approaches uh, along with something else to provide context. So that's another application. I'm going to do one more variation on a the theme here, and it was a technique developed by Dr. Alan Andrews, so oh, back again, I guess, in the mid-1900s. And it's a variation on the incorporation of geometric angles along with basic trend line analysis. Andrews made a fortune just on a simple concept. He did a number of different things, but the, the technique or the construction, I, I would imagine, for which he is most widely known is his pitchfork. It's called a pitchfork for obvious reasons. The, the geometric construction kind of has, if you use your creative imagination, the appearance of a pitchfork. What he does is he took, you take three points. So you see point one, point two, point three. And it can be done in uh, one of two ways. You start with a low or a bottom, and then you find another bottom, and then you find the midpoint higher, the highest point in between those two bottoms. And you can see how we did it. Or alternatively, and this is how you can define and, and rein in, if you will, and define a trend in a rising market. You could do the same in a falling trend, just the, the opposite. You would find a start, your point one would be a high, and your point three would be a high, and you would look at the, or locate the, lowest point in between uh, those two tops, and that would be your point two. Uh, essentially, another way to state this in terms of the how we think about the construction, you want to find an initial thrust, and then you look for the retracement to that thrust. So basically, point three on the slide we're seeing currently is the end point of the retracement against the initial thrust. But if you have an initial thrust and then the retracement, you, have, you can locate the three points essential to creating the Andrews Pitchfork construction. What you then do is you bisect. You simply, uh, it's not drawn on this, on this diagram, but often some of the pitchforks will actually draw a straight line connecting point two, two and three. All right. And then you take, you find the midpoint. You would simply bisect the line, the, the straight line connecting the top of point two with the bottom of point three. You find the midpoint. That's simply a matter of measuring that. Again, with the program like Metastock, this is done automatically for us. In the old days, I would have to do this with measuring devices, protractor, ruler, uh, compass, etc. But today, the technology makes everything convenient for us. So you can see the resulting construction. But essentially, after getting the midpoint uh, of that line that connects point two and three, you then extend a line from point one straight through that midpoint and run it out into the future. In this case, it's in a northeasterly direction. That that's line is what Andrews referred to as his median line. And then there are two other things you need to do. We simply then extend a line from point two and point three uh, out into the future, but the line should be parallel with our median line. And that creates or finishes the construction, and it has the obvious similarity to the pitchfork. That's why it's called that. You will be amazed at how often this construction on a chart will define price action, locate ahead of time support and resistance levels, and the trajectory of given trends. And then, of course, uh, there's, uh, I, I could talk an hour just about the application of this pitchfork analysis. But essentially, just to give one other point about it, when the market breaks through a given line, we're working on the proposition that it's more likely going to gravitate and find its way to the next line. If you break down, say, below the outer line, the line that was run off of point three, uh, by extension, you draw another line in equal distance, uh, another parallel line to all of the lines that are drawn, an equal distance away, so that they're all equidistant one from another. And you can see that at see the uh, arrow where it says parallel channel to three at same width. And notice how nicely that caught the little double bottom there, uh, for those traders that are aware of that. And then 
the median line further out in by the end of the chart or near the end of the chart on the right uh, uh, acted as a future level of overhead resistance and created the top. So again, uh, in a, when used in a dynamic way on an ongoing basis, the Andrews Pitchfork uh, trend line application, it can be quite insightful. I have another example of this in the next slide. Uh, this was taken off of the Metastock program uh, and its more recent activity of the uh, December, the front month in the S&P or E-mini. And you can see the bottom here, our starting point, again I just push the button and it does, our starting point is the bottom in July. I saw that was the point, the start, the end of a downtrend, a generic downtrend, and then we moved up to an initial thrust and that's where the uppermost trend line is run off of and that's the end of that thrust and then I caught the retracement down to the little triple bottom that occurred that see those bottoms there uh, that's the end of August I remember it vividly because I was short coming into that and I thought that was an interesting formation uh, to be short when you have a triple bottom that's a sign of strength uh, but essentially on the 25th of August the mid well, the middle of those three bottoms was the 27th, and I think the final bottom was the 30th or the 31st. I can't remember which, but I ran it off the midpoint, the middle bottom of that triple bottom there, and uh, marking the end of the three uh, of the retracement. So I have point one, two, and three going left to right respectively, even though I didn't mark them on this uh, particular slide. But it's the same logic as the previous slide. What we what do we do? You would draw a line connecting point two and three, or the top of the initial thrust to the end of the retracement. You draw a straight line. You then bisect or find the midpoint of that line, and then your initial trend line, what Andrews refers to as his median line, is drawn off of point one, the, the low back there, the first point, the point, the bottom, and uh, the lowest point on the screen, in fact, uh, the low in July. And you run that line through the midpoint of the retracement, or the pullback. And then that's your median line, and extend that out into the future in a northeasterly direction, since it's an uptrend in this case. And then you draw your parallel outliers, if you will. You draw the line off of point two, which is the uppermost trend line, and the one from the triple bottom midpoint in at the end of August. And that creates a channel through which we're going to expect to see a lot of the market price action. Maybe not. It may break out above, in which case I would expect it to gravitate to the uppermost line. Uh, or not, or if it bounces, uh, if it's repulsed to a lower uh, level, then I would expect it to find a level of support at whatever point in time we find the lower median line or the lower trend line uh, at whatever price level we would expect that to occur. All right, so that those are three basic uh, formations of, of, of trend line analysis or applications of trend line analysis. The simple trend line, uh, the use of a trend line incorporating uh, some geometric shapes such as a square. I'm getting an indication you just lost. Okay, I'm back. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm seeing I need to watch this more frequently. <laughs> uh, hopefully, okay, I'm back. Thanks for the feedback there. All right. Um, all I was saying, a quick recap, I was saying that's three applications of some very basic trend line analysis, all of which I find quite efficient different one from another and effective. Let's move to the next slide. And I'm going to present a little, a very sophisticated idea. This was presented to me by actually one of my teachers, Michael Jenkins. And he observed at some point the fact that trends aren't always linear. Uh, very often there is an acceleration of trend. Uh, life would be too simple if everything in the world was linear. Newtonian mechanics would describe all market motion. And this is one of the factors and reasons why we don't perfectly comprehend and have a set of guidelines or concepts or even equations that perfectly describes market motion. Uh, the interesting irony in there is that it's, that it's a good thing. But we actually uh, have a technique, and again this was developed by one of my teachers, Michael Jenkins, some time ago, uh, where he incorporates and has he recognized the idea that often markets will accelerate. A given trend might accelerate according to a logarithmic uh, progression as opposed to a simply linear progression. There's para, uh, so very often you'll see parabolic motion, linear motion, as well as logarithmic motion. And a little technique, I won't belabor, but you'd have to, if you have a scientific calculator that gives us an ability to calculate and compute logs and anti-logs, you can do this. Essentially, if you look at point one down here, uh, what the idea does is you take a low price, and if you take the log of that low, 
we, we compute that, and then you compute, we just set up a regular trend line here from point one to two, and then you take the low of point two. You could also compute its log. So a log is just another way to keep track of the prices. It's another uh, way of stating a given price. So essentially what uh, this technique does in order to calculate a, a more approximate or a finer trend line that will contain and, and forecast, in fact, when a market is moving according to a logarithmic pattern. Um, but essentially, we can take the difference in time. If you look at point one and point two, the number of days is 269. The delta between those two bottoms coming in is 269 days. The respective lows, well, the low at point one is about 605. This is, uh, what is this, the S&P, the cash market in the S&P. And then the price low at point two was 733 and change, basically. And the difference in days between those two points is approximately 269. So I calculated the respective logs, the natural logarithms of both of those low prices, and I get those two things. Essentially what I want to do, and I take the difference between the logs, you see? And I grant you, and guys, if you're not following me here, I, I, this is a more sophisticated technique, but it is an application of trend analysis, and it's what I get into with the students. But um, it's, it's a very efficient idea, it's uh, very forward thinking here. But, uh, essentially, if you take the difference between the two logs and divide that by the time difference, you can get an average log points per day between those two points. And then what I did is I went over here and I found a third point, another low, say we're at 0.3 all the way on the right side of the chart. And I see, I take, I took the difference in time between 0.2 and 0.3, and I took my average number of log points per day and multiplied that times the, the time difference. The difference in time between 0.2 the bottom at point two, and that bottom over here at point three was about 545 days. So I took my log point average, the average points or average log points per day times that, and I come up with a number. Essentially, it enables us, um, I'm just trying to give you a sense of this. I know I'm glossing over these details, but essentially it gives us a means of forecasting where the market's going to be in an appropriate trend line that can create a better fit. Notice the obvious difference. After point two, it's as if the market moved into a different realm or a different neighborhood. So if we continue to move to utilize the initial trend line, that is the trend line drawn off of point one and two, it would have nearly caught some of the bottoms, the double bottom further out in the future. But uh, we got we obtained a finer fit by utilizing or adjusting the trend line via this logarithmic approach. Uh, and for anyone that's interested, we can delve into that. But it's just another application or variation on basic trend line analysis. Let's move on. Altogether different concept, and I call this the velocity of trend. This is for me my starting point when it's, if from a practical standpoint uh, when I'm looking to identify good trades. I always tell everyone uh, in my teaching the very first thing I do is I look at my price chart of a market uh, or any market that I might be considering as a possible or a potential candidate for an opportunity to trade in, and I ask myself the simple question. The question is, what's the market doing? Remember what I said at the beginning of the presentation about 20, 30 minutes ago. There are only three possible answers to that question if you are observing price action on a flat surface, up, down, or sideways. And remember I said I eliminate from, any, from further consideration and analysis any market for which the net motion is sideways. I'm interested on, in a figurative sense, getting on board a train that's going somewhere. We know by definition you can only profit in markets where there's a net differential in, in price, up or down. Sideways markets may, from an anticipatory standpoint, they're, they're kind of, figuratively speaking, they're still the train in the station. And there is some finite probability they're going to leave the station, say leave Grand Central Station and head towards Chicago or Florida. Or California. But in terms of the spectrum of probabilities, if you look at the entire left hand side of the screen, and this is the silver contract, and it's an excellent example of this velocity of trend concept that I want to illustrate, and it's always my starting point in trend analysis. Notice more or less from the beginning of the chart back in November of whatever year that is, or I guess that's this year, this is a daily chart of silver, through the end of August essentially. The market was doing nothing. Now we, on various time frames, you can trade it, but notice the obvious difference in terms of behavior of the market. 
when we got over here to the end of August and uh, the last couple of months, it took off. It blasted off like a rocket, and essentially that's what I'm looking for. Velocity of trend. I am looking for markets that are going up or down. The velocity, more or less, can be obtained or inferred based on the slope. In other words, the two-dimensional analog of velocity is slope. So quite literally, that's how I filter for the best opportunities. What's the steepest slope of all possible on a two-dimensional surface? A vertical line. Rarely do you see markets or charts of markets moving straight up or straight down. If I found a chart going straight up or straight down, all things being equal, that would be my first choice. Now, there's a, now there are a couple of objections that might present in your thinking. <clears throat> One is the obvious. Surely a market that's moving up at such a relatively high rate of incline, let's say, or moving down at such a fast or steep slope can't sustain itself. Well, you said that. I didn't. I didn't come up with this idea. Uh, no less a genius than one Isaac Newton. So for in a sense, he is responsible hundreds of years ago for coming up with the most spectacular and most efficient and most profitable trading methodology I have discovered in 30 years in this business. All I'm saying is, or basing this concept on, is an application or rather an exploitation of the first law of motion. I'm talking about the principle of inertia. I am not saying that this market, or in this case silver, is guaranteed to keep rising. I am telling you from a statistical spectrum standpoint, in terms of my perusing and, and looking and filtering for good opportunities, this market's path of least resistance is to keep on going higher. Why? That's what it's doing currently. What does the first law of motion say? It's, it takes the least amount of energy and therefore work for this market to keep on doing what it's doing. And that's ought to, that ought to be where my head is at, at any point in time, in the selection of a trade. Something has to happen. And then maybe it happened with the recent top, what, four or five days ago. I don't know. I couple this with two rules of thumb, and we'll see this in a minute. In this case, where we have a rising chart, the, the, question I, the only question I have is, is it, if I compare this chart of silver with 10 other or 20 other charts of 20 other different markets, the only question I have to narrow down to the best trend possible, therefore, and I can translate that into the best possible trade is, is it moving up fast enough? That is to say at the steepest slope. The steeper the slope, the higher the momentum, the more probable we will have, you will see a persistence of that current trend. I have made more money with this simple concept than every other concept I know, every other model, technique, indicator, etc. put together over the years. Again, I cannot take credit for this. Once again, no less a genius than one Isaac Newton is responsible for this. The reason this is so effective is because it's an energy consideration. Again, something has to happen in the world for this market of silver to stop rising. Nothing has to happen from an informational standpoint in the world, fundamentally speaking, let's say, for this thing to keep doing what it's doing in the net. Now, the inherent arbitrariness, because a question will come up possibly, well, Glenn, you just look at any chart and you ask yourself from left to right, what's it doing? The answer is yes. It doesn't matter if I was looking as a day trader at a 10 minute chart or a five minute or a 60 second or a tick chart. I'll go from every time frame to an, any extreme of a time frame, this concept will work. The inherent arbitrariness <clears throat> of this concept is offset by the self consistency. Your forecast, see my forecast based on this analysis Again, what's the analysis? I ask myself a simple question. What is the market doing? From left to right, it's going up. My forecast ought to be that it's most likely going to keep going up. Why? Again, based on the first law of motion, that's the thing, that's the trajectory that requires the least amount of energy or effort or work. I am not saying that the market is guaranteed to go up. I am saying that is its path of least resistance, and that's my first thought. Every form of analysis, every filter to which I subject this chart and market thereafter, is simply an extension to see if I have convergence, if I have other factors that would me that would agree and support what the pure trend, the truth of the market has already told me. Now, the caveat or the qualification to this, in the case of a rising trend, such as we see exhibited in the silver market here, is you accompany you you utilize the concept of buying above resistance. So, for example, you see where the market is at, uh, through the today. This is a chart that goes through today. You want to locate your resistance level. 
People write books on how to locate resistance. A very simple way is find a top that's higher than the current market. Well, we see the obvious one, what is that, three or four days or four or five days back from today. Put your buy stop above that top. Allow the market to prove yourself or prove this concept. I don't know what happened at the top of uh, uh, this market a few days ago, four days ago, when it topped out at the level that it did. I really don't care. What is critical to comprehend is something or things conspired to prevent the market from trading one tick higher than the level at the top of this chart. If it happened at that point in time, there's a greater than average probability it could happen again should the market revisit those levels. If, it can, if the world changes tomorrow, next week, next year, in a manner that's sufficient or that would enable the market to overcome or offset whatever factors were present at the time of this trend forming the top, then I want to be the beneficiary of those changed conditions and I get stopped into the trade. If it doesn't, I've got a buy stop working above the resistance zone and the market goes into free fall. In retrospect, I will simply interpret its time on the upside was up. Something significant from an energy standpoint occurred to indicate or enable the market in consistency with that first law of motion, an outside force occurred to cause it to move along another path. It's that simple. Case in point, move to the next slide. Same idea, just in reverse, in a downtrend, the US exhibited by the US dollar, left to right. Now, here I have to do a variation. If you actually compared the current price on the end of this chart today, on the right side, with the very beginning of the chart on the left, it's more or less the same, and by the principle I mentioned earlier, you'd probably rule this out. So I'm going to be arbitrary and just go from, you know, back there in uh, the beginning of the year, we were going up, and then I'm, I'm just going to arbitrarily pick a starting point. The forecast you achieve using this simple velocity of trend analysis can only be assumed to have a relevancy for a period of time proportional to the period of time you use to generate the very forecast. That's what I mean when I said or suggested the self-consistency of this analysis offsets the arbitrariness. You might be using a platform other than Metastock, let's say. God forbid, I'm joking, but I actually am serious. But um, if you were, you may have a different view of the very same market. That's what I'm, I'm merely pointing this out to introduce and to bring up the arbitrariness inherent in this, anal in this type of analysis, simple velocity of trend. I understand that. Typically, I abhor any form of arbitrariness in the analysis. But in this case, it's acceptable because, again, to repeat what I just said, the forecast you reach or the conclusion concerning the future course of that market should only be assumed to have a relevancy for a period of time not exceeding the period of time you use to generate the very forecast. That's a mouthful. But you can see from the top of the market that occurred back in June, let's say, through today, if I just isolated that portion of the price action, the quick question I ask is, what's the thing doing? It's going down. I almost don't even really care what this is. The technician part of my brain really is oblivious to that. I see lines on a screen. You see what I'm saying? I'm interested in velocity because the, the faster a system, any system, anything in this universe, I'm limiting my conversation now to the US dollar index by way of example, but any system, the more the higher rate at which it's traveling, the more likely it will persist moving in that given direction. The, more, the greater the outside force would have to be to stop it in its tracks. I want to exploit that for a profit. Okay, so in this case we just have the opposite example of what we just showed in silver. A falling market. It's going down. Didn't take any of you listening to the sound of my voice uh, but a nanosecond to determine that visually. If you can do that, you can make a fortune. How so? You, your initial conclusion is it's most likely going to keep going down. And I know this goes against the grain of everything in most of the textbooks out there because most of us are caught up in this mindset of looking for change. Well, here is, based on the purity of the trend analysis I alluded to at the outset of today's session, the power. This is why trend analysis is at the ascendancy of everything I do. I only get paid based on the amount of time that my positions are in strict alignment with the trend. This thing doesn't have to do, the US dollar index doesn't have to do anything. Nothing happen, has to happen in the world for it to continue moving down. You see, something has to happen in the world for it to stop moving down and to start either moving sideways or upward. So I want to bet that it's more probable nothing will happen in the world 
than something happening. See how simple that is? So that's my initial bet. To hedge my bet, my corresponding rule of thumb in a falling market is sell below support. Remember, two rules of thumb that go against the grain of traditional traders' mindsets for the most part. Most traders like to trade the range. This is a breakout, the opposite paradigm. Put your order to sell below the bottom, the support zone. By doing such, you're set, essentially putting the market to the ultimate asset test. If it can't take out the bottom that came in, what is that, four days ago, we can construe from that, it's not ready to go down. On the other hand, if the market does take out the bottom and you've got your sell stop sitting in the direct flight path of that market, your sell order will be a beneficiary of that downward momentum, and you increase your odds of generating or extracting a return from that move. That's the simplest form of trend analysis I know. Um, and again, I cannot claim credit for its elucidation and discovery. One Isaac Newton, hundreds of years ago. That's always my starting point. Next item, I know I'm running out of time here, so let me move on. Everyone talks in terms of primary trend. Uh, a very simple approach with that is specific to the weekly chart that I utilize to define what I call a primary trend. And I know markets are fractal, they scale, there's a self-similarity of structure as you shift from one time horizon to another. That's true. However, that being said, what I'm going to tell you now based is solely pertaining to the weekly chart. You can see the top of the generic bull market, October of 07, on the left side of your screen. I, I see the question, so would I put my stop loss one tick above the high or low? That's a nuance. In principle, you're correct. The answer to that question, whoever asked it, um, is, or Sarah, uh, it, it's a function of other factors. The degree to which, let me say in a qualitative sense, the, deg you know, the closer above the resistance top or below the support zone, the more aggressive you are, certainly, in a qualitative sense, and the, and the further away, the more uh, conservative you are. The actual spread of distance, in terms of the actual precise location, is going to be a function of other factors. But that's a good question. But let me say this, one final point before I move to the weekly chart. Just the fact, even if you have an, a less than precise placement of that entering stop order, just the fact that it's above the resistance or below the support is going to give you a quantum realm of advantage over traders that are doing it the other way. You see what I'm saying? But yeah, you have a very precise question. I'll try and come back at the end and go into more detail on that. Um, on the weekly chart, you see in an obvious sense, the top of the generic bull market, um, October of 07, and down to the bottom that came in, Mar the first week of March of 09. Okay? In an intuitive, obvious sense, clearly the net motion was lower. The question is going to arise, as it always does in our heads, how do we interpret everything after that bottom that came in the first week in March of 2009, the bottom of the chart? Should we? In, there are two obvious ways of, of describing that price action. Is all of that motion off of that bottom on that screen through today, should we interpret it as a new generic bull market? Or alternatively, do we describe it as a, just a rally possibly in a, bull, in, a, in, a, in a bear? Do we have objective means of differentiating between that type of price action? And over the years, all sorts of things have been done to do that. Here is an idea that I utilize. It is, again, specific to the weekly chart. Two features, two sp attributes which are specific to a downtrend are it's the downtrend's proclivity to generate or to form a succession of lower and lower tops. That's one of the attributes. And then the other is simultaneously lower and lower bottoms. So these are the, the two specific attributes that are consistent or peculiar to downtrending or bear markets. Notice from the top in October of 07, you have a succession. As you move your pointer uh, from left to right, you see a succession of lower and lower tops. And we also see a succession of lower and lower bottoms. As long, Here's my rule of thumb. And again, this is specific to the weekly chart. When you, as long as you see one of those events occurring, that is the, the successive formation of lower and lower tops or lower and lower bottoms, I will maintain my description of the falling price action as just that, a bear market. At whatever point in time, after you've seen a falling market, at whatever point thereafter, you no longer see both of those phenomena occurring. That's when I begin, that's a stronger indication to suggest that there has been a sea change 
from a primary standpoint of how I define primary trim. If you see where the crosshairs are on this screen, the vertical and horizontal crosshairs, look at the vertical crosshair, you see? And notice one bar to the left of that crosshair is a top that just ever so slightly took out a top, a previous top when the market was coming down. Notice the vertical crosshair again, and one price bar to the left was a top, and it slightly took out a top just across, if you go about an inch and a quarter maybe, or an inch, I don't know, to the left, you'll see a top, that the top, just one bar to the left of the vertical line, crosshair, created a higher top. And then if you look five bars to the right, you have a bottom that formed. Everything I'm saying now is in reference to that vertical crosshair on this slide. One bar to the left is a top that took out a previous top of significance, and five bars to the right is a bottom that took out the lowest point on the chart. So by the time I got six bars over on this weekly chart, I am really beginning, all other pieces of evidence aside for the moment, and I'm looking at this in isolation in a vacuum, that is strong indication to me. I have now, at that point, seen the formation of a higher bottom and a higher top that's a strong indication to more strong, uh, strongly suggest a transition of the overall trend from a bear rally into a new bona fide generic bull. That, so I start there as another overlapping or contextual, broad contextual way of defining what I call a primary trend. Completely different from everything we've just talked about. That's the point. My final slide, I'm, because I'm just running low on time here, is the technique that I alluded to at the outset, an idea I came up with uh, about eight or nine years ago. It's based on, incidentally, research that Dr. George Lane did many years ago. George Lane, for those of you who are not familiar, is the gentleman, I guess his primary contribution to the field of technical analysis, although he's done a lot of things, but the thing he's most widely known for is the creation of the stochastic oscillator. Ironic as it might seem, some years after he uh, created and presented the stochastic for traders worldwide, uh, and I would say probably the stochastic along with the RSI are the two most widely utilized technical indicators in all of the world. But um, that aside, interestingly enough, he did research specific to a 14 period relative strength index. Why he did that, I'm not sure. But uh, essentially, a question he put to himself was, wouldn't it make sense? Uh, it's interesting, when Wilder, Wells Wilder, who developed these, the RSI in 1979, uh, for overbought, oversold, he utilized, and you'll find this in most textbooks, 70 and 30 is the thresholds. And, and that's across the board, any and all markets. In other words, if the RSI line crosses above 70, it indicates the market's overbought. That's strictly a reversal indication. If, it's, if the RSI line falls below 30, it indicates the market's oversold. Or you would expect, correspondingly, the market to reverse the upside. Well, subsequent to that, some years later, George Lane came along and said, pertaining to this RSI, and it's a 14 period RSI, and by the way, it will apply to any time frame. The analysis that I'm talking about right this moment is specific to the 14 period relative strength index, or RSI, but you can apply it to any time scale. I do this on a 10 minute chart for day trading, I'll do it on a weekly chart, a daily, etc. But it is specific to the 14 period RSI. Essentially the question, the insightful point that Lane asked himself was, wouldn't it make sense that rather than just using 70 and 30 across the board, if we developed separate criteria by which we could de define a market as being overbought or oversold. One set of conditions applied to a bull market, a rising trend or a bull. The other completely different set would be applicable to a bear market. And that's what he did. Uh, without going into the details on that, he came up with two sets of numbers. There are two numbers I want you to think about, 40 and 65. And these two numbers are in the larger data set that Dr. Lane came up with. And I came up with an idea by which, in a more objective way, at any time, for any market, on any time frame, you can define trend. If you start on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, when this contract was rather illiquid, notice, very sketchy, but notice the top up there right before the first vertical line. We were certainly, in an obvious sense, rising. But what would your thinking have been, what would you have been thinking when the market stopped going up, hit that little top there, and come over to the first vertical line, it looks purple on my screen, when it stopped, stopped rising and started to come down. Again, how do you characterize the falling motion? Is it simply a temporary pullback in that generic bull market? This is going to make a big decision. Should I be adding to my existing longs at a better price, or should I be going short? 
A crucial decision can depend on how you objectively describe the price action at any time. Here's my thinking. Once the market, after it stopped rising, you hit that top there, right before the purple vertical line on your slide, on your screen, stops going up and starts to fall. Once it falls far enough to cause the RSI below to drop below 40, that's the demarcation or threshold point. That clearly, for, for various reasons, based on my studies, is correlated with a higher probability of a transition from bull to bear. So notice down at the bottom of the slide, on January 22nd, the value of the RSI was 37 and change. It had just crossed below 40. The day before, it was above 40. And that's the threshold. So if I had not been thinking in a global sense of defining trend from bull to bear or bear to bull, certainly by that point, I would have had greater evidence from looking at and studying the correlation between the behavior of motion of the oscillator, the RSI, and the price. And you had an opportunity to capture some portion of that move. Likewise, notice we hit the bottom, kind of in the midpoint between, or about the first third of that motion, not quite at the midpoint, rather, between the two vertical lines. And then all of a sudden it stopped going down and started to go up. Well, at what point is that, when, after the market hit the bottom there and started to go up, do you abandon your interpretation or definition of the trend as a downtrend? Is it just a temporary rally? Or at what point ought you consider it to have transitioned from a bear to a bull or a rising trend? 65 is our critical number here. Once, however high the market rises, if it does not rise high enough to cause the RSI below to take out 65, I would still have been interpreting that rising price action to be a rally within the bear. Once, however, the market rose high enough to cause the RSI below to take out 65, that's much more strongly correlated with a transition of the market to and redefinition of, to a bull market. And you can see what happened. Due to time factors, folks, I'm going to stop. You can see the progression. I have two other episodes there where this could have worked to illustrate a change in how we can define the trend. Uh, let me go to my final slide and wrap things up because I want to entertain questions if time allows. Again, you see here we have a webinar special where we're providing mentorship at 50% discount. You see the number, 1-800-339-8588, and our website. I am currently taking a few students, or I have time available for a couple of students. And uh, Kelly, if I can take questions, I'll be happy to. It's up to the time factor. I don't know. But uh, that's um, essentially what I wanted to present. One final note, let me say, uh, in terms of you, you want to utilize all these factors as a filter, each one against the other. Great, I have five minutes. So if there are any listeners there who have any questions, I'll be happy to do justice. It's very difficult because any one question I could elaborate on, but I'll try and at least um, uh, give a, at least a cursory uh, response or addressing of any question. And then again, remember the, you know, here's the commercial, guys. 50% discount on mentorship. I do have spaces for about two or three students. And if you're interested in more detail, I'd be happy to work with you and go into more detail on any of these questions. Any questions, guys? Kelly, I don't see. Maybe I might have answered questions on route or, okay, do I have a mechanical way to identify? Nikos wants to know, do I have a mechanical way to identify and eliminate sideway market? Good question. Very good question. I have to think about it for a minute. Um, I would, my immediate thought on that, Nikos, is slope. Uh, uh, very often, markets that have been in periods of channels will, when they leave a channel, up or down, gap, not all the time, but uh, a gap up or down uh, is often sort of an exclamation market, uh, an exclamation market mark by the market, if you will, that it's leaving one mode of behavior or one neighborhood of behavior, i.e. the channel where it's moving sideways and moving into a different realm. Uh, sometimes this is accompanied by uh, a chart pattern, very often you'll see triangles, for those of you who are familiar with classical chart analysis, but sometimes it isn't. Um, I would say uh, sometimes it's an intuitive sense, and I hate to fall back on that, where you can create a set of parallel trend, trend lines identifying the low end of the channel and then the upper, uh, two channel lines, horizontal, two trend lines that are both horizontal, defining that trend. You kind of had that on the uh, silver chart, um, uh, but essentially there are a, a, Again, because of time, there are a number of ways by which you can more quantitatively differentiate when a market has left um, uh, a mode of sideways channeling and entered into a 
a realm of uh, definite uh, upward or downward motion. There are a number of different ways we can do that. I know I'm not really addressing the question, it's just due to time. Um, oh, sure, uh, someone, Stuart, is asking, can I repeat the 40 and 65 levels? Let me quickly tell you where those numbers come from. George Lane came up with two sets of numbers to help traders more efficiently utilize an RSI oscillator in, in the analysis of overbought, oversold. One set of numbers, there are four numbers in each set, are, are related to bear markets. Uh, they are 20 to 30 on the low end, that's oversold for a bear market, 55 to 65 on the high end, that's overbought for a bear market, and 40 to 50 on the low end, uh, uh, and 80 to 90 on the high end for a bull market. So notice those levels. If you look at the second set of numbers I just gave you, 40 to 50 on the low end are oversold, and 80 to 90. 40 is the lowest RSI value that we typically associate with bull markets. So my logic was, if you see price action that has previously been rising and all of a sudden hits a top and starts to come down, should it drop to a level that takes the RSI value outside of values we typically associate or correlate to bull markets, it's reasonable to assume that the market has left bull market territory and has transitioned into a bear market. And the opposite could be said too. If you see a market that has previously been falling, it hits a bottom and starts rising. Well, we're wondering what to make of that rising action. Is it just a temporary rally within the broader bear? Should I be looking to amplify my shorts or initiate shorts? Or is it a possibly the new beginning of a bull? Well, the idea here is once a market rises to a level sufficiently high to cause the oscillator to take out 65, where do I get 65 from? It's the highest RSI value correlated with bear market territory. So it's reasonable to assume once the market rises high enough to force the oscillator to leave values that are correlated with bear markets, we can. that's a correlation to a transition by the market where it's to indicate it's left the bear market definition and entered into a whole new realm of bull market territory. I'm using a 14 period RSI, Mike. Um, you say relative to the S&P or relative to the price of the underlying stock. Rel this can be applied, I'm not certain I understand the question. This analysis can be applied universally to any asset class, S&P index, in the, any individual stock or equity, a commodity futures contract, a Forex contract, any asset class. That analysis that I came up with, the last uh, correlation that I was just going over, is applicable to. You're, you're quite welcome. Any other questions, guys? Bear in mind, any one of these topics are, are so in-depth we could elaborate, and so I necessarily, due to time constraints, had to provide just a cursory explanation. How, do, how long does it take, uh, Israel would like to know, how long does it take to get out of a cyclical stock I currently hold? Um, can you elaborate? I'm not, I want to make sure I understand your question. If I wrote it when it was a bear, in other words, it was a stock that you were buying, you, you got long, you bought the stock, it's been pulling back against you. If, I think if I interpret your question, if it's moving down uh, um, in con, in, in, out, of con, out of sync with what you'd like, yeah, okay. Well, that's a very different question. I, I'll be happy to give it, uh, it has nothing to do with trend analysis per se. That's a function of uh, a lot of factors, technical and the integration of your technical uh, theoretical chart consideration, number one, with your money management. Ultimately, money management has the say. So I always, let me say that at the outset. In other words, if the stock has traveled out of alignment to a degree that is inconsistent, where you've lost an amount inconsistent with an appropriate amount of, or percentage of loss of your total equity, if you, you know, certainly that's a, as a final backdrop. Having said that, though, in a theoretical utopia world where money's no issue based on theoretical considerations of the chart, there's a whole set of cues. We want to identify in a general sense where your key areas of support are. There are many ways to do that. Um, but primarily, um, after you've located where the, the support zones are on the chart, and if you've seen a violation of those support zones, and if it happens that the violation of those support zones, and that is to say where the market has traveled, since you bought it based relative to your cost basis of the stock, happens to also be at a level that it, 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 it transcends your haircut. In other words, it transcends the level of loss of equity as a percentage that you no longer have the luxury of allowing your system that caused you to buy this stock in the first place to manifest its best element, to see this thing turn around. In other words, the greater good here, 
you're, you're deferring to the greater good of capital preservation as opposed to allowing your system any further leeway or excursion away from the ideal. It's the lesser of the, of the evils, in a sense. You see what I'm saying? You know, the answer to that question will be due to a synthesis of a number of ideas. But, for, but, but final, in the final analysis, because the money is connected, you know, that's ultimately the backdrop. But to the extent you have not exceeded your allowable tolerance for loss, number one, and the market is not and or integrated with that, it has not taken out levels of support beyond which you feel are, are disproportionate with your system. So it's a complex question, but it's a good question. It's an appropriate question. It's one we deal with all the time. But it would be really by looking at uh, where does the chart say uh, you should no longer, you know, allow for your system to see its best elements, you know, and what it projected for it to do in the first place. But since, you know, it's saying that there's some uh, error that's crept in. Uh, so it's a consideration, consideration or an integration of both of those factors. Where, based on the theory of the chart structure, does the market say you should get out? And how does that reconcile or not reconcile with your money management or capital allocation ideas? That's in a general sense without, you know, each, each situation is, is, is based on circumstances that define it. So other than that, I, that would be the general sense of how you would know when to get out or not to. Any other questions, guys? Bear in mind, just while I'm waiting for any additional questions, trend analysis is, an, is one component. And again, any one of these components. And what makes a market is that every trader feels that there are different forms of analysis and different techniques that are the most relevant. For me, at the outset of today's webinar, I mentioned the types of analysis that I feel are the most uh, important. And I gave you, uh, I presented them in the order of importance that I place on them, different traders might see things differently. And again, this is what creates different perceptions and viewpoints and creates differing forms of trading. That's what makes a market. Any one of these, I could, we could do seminars or webinars on any one of those forms of analysis other than trend, on the timing considerations. That could take you know, another hour or more. On a broad-based market model such as Elliott or fractal analysis or chaos uh, nonlinear theory, that's another whole uh, form of, of analysis. Uh, that has, you know, can be elaborate on and people write and have great amounts of knowledge in. Um, just basic divergence is a study in and of itself. The ADX, um, do I apply the ADX with three, the three components ever? Um, good question. I used to, I don't utilize, I'm very familiar with the ADX, one of the, another um, indicator that um, I used many years ago. I don't on a regular basis, I understand the virtues of the ADX and its construction. It's for various reasons, but in the scheme of things, I personally don't utilize it on a, as, with the degree of regularity I did, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, I don't want you to infer from that necessarily that I don't feel there's value in an ADX. An ADX, the primary thrust of an ADX oscillator is it's a momentum. When Wilder created that initially, uh, it, it's charting or, or tracking or sensitive to different aspects in some of the standard velocity oscillators like your RSI or stochastic or MACD. Um, so it's a very different, and it has a very good... Uh, approach. So I don't want to imply that I don't ever consider or I feel that it's not worthwhile to look at an ADX. I do. It's just that for me it didn't make it into my top four. Uh, and let me explain that by a little. A lot of the things that I feel are at the top of the totem pole may be inherently take into account some other factors such as like what an ADX might take into account. In other words, if ADX is in a sense, and I'm oversimplifying here, if it's tracking momentum, maybe some of the other things I look at inherently also track momentum. So therefore, I don't need to uh, apply an ADX. So if a trader did not utilize a set of tools that to some extent had a, uh, had a monitoring of momentum, it would be a reason to uh, certainly ex in an explicit sense utilize an ADX oscillator. That would be my best answer for that. Hopefully that helps, guys. Kelly, you tell me how we're doing on time. If we have time, I'll be happy to. I'm in no rush, but it's up to you. Okay. Well, then, guys, again, thanks for uh, listening in, and I hope I've imparted some useful information. And, again, if you need to, you can contact us at Pacific Trading Academy and or the folks at Metastock, and I'll be happy to make myself available in any way possible. Thank you again, guys.